recorded. Hi everyone, welcome to our first Meal Talk webinar on school breakfast. My name is Mimi Wu and I am with Child Nutrition Programs at the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service. My co-presenters and I are so excited to have you with us today. Before we begin, let's go over some housekeeping tips. So as you heard Desiree mention, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted at a later date. All who registered for this webinar will receive an email once the recording is available. This webinar is also being live captioned. So to view live captioning, use the multimedia viewer. It should appear automatically, or you can click the three dots on your screen and then select the multimedia viewer. Then click continue. You should be able to view the live captioning. You may use the controls located at the bottom of the multimedia viewer to change view settings. If you're unable to see that multimedia viewer, please just send a comment through the Q&A box. During today's presentation, some links will be shared using a QR code. Have your QR code reader app or smartphone um, camera ready to scan. You will also get an email tomorrow with all the websites that we mentioned during today's webinar, as well as a PDF file of all of the slides. If you stay for the entire webinar today, you will also receive an email with a certificate of participation on Wednesday, March 23rd. If you're viewing this webinar with multiple people, you'll be able to print a certificate for each person. We will have time at the end of this webinar to take questions. The chat box has been disabled for this webinar, but you can use the question and answer box at any time during the webinar to enter your question. So now let's move on to the topic of today's webinar, school breakfast. The school meals program and the people that help implement them play a critical role in national efforts to improve children's nutrition security. Nutrition security is consistent access to safe, nutritious food that supports optimal health and well-being through all stages of life. So as I mentioned, today's webinar focuses on school breakfast and the important role it plays in helping children get the nutrition they need to learn, grow, and be healthy. USDA's School Nutrition Meal Cost Study showed that school breakfast is a big supplier of foods most kids don't get enough of, fruits, whole grains, and dairy foods like milk. This study found that school breakfast, on average, provided kids with about 48% of the fruit, 40% of the dairy foods, and 30% of the whole grains they need for the entire day. In addition to these nutritional benefits, school breakfasts also help kids learn healthy eating habits. These healthy habits can help kids grow into healthy adults that have lower risk of chronic diseases, such as diabetes and heart disease. We know that school breakfast would not be possible without the tireless work of the school nutrition professionals who make breakfast available to 15 million kids in our country each and every day. This week is National School Breakfast Week, which celebrates not only the benefits of school breakfast, but also the hard work that school nutrition professionals put in to ensure America's school children get a healthy start every morning. In honor of National School Breakfast Week, Team Nutrition recently released some fun new materials about school breakfast that can be used at school breakfast events, not only this week, but any time during the school year. Materials include downloadable photo props that the school can print and have students use in photos at celebrations and other events, downloadable social media images that you can use to spread the message about school breakfast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and an infographic and video that tells students, parents, and the community about the benefits of school breakfast. All of these materials and more are available on Team Nutrition's school breakfast webpage. And again, you will be getting an email tomorrow with all the websites that we mentioned during today's webinar, so you'll definitely see these links again. Again, I am so pleased that so many of you have joined us for this first Meal Talk webinar about school breakfast. Our agenda is based on hot topics that school nutrition professionals have been asking us about, including school breakfast requirements for the upcoming school year, 
offering meat and meat alternates at school breakfast, offering smoothies as part of reimbursable school meals, and best practices to reduce added sugars at school breakfast. The resources we're talking about today were created under USDA's Teen Nutrition Initiative, which supports the school meals programs by providing grants and nutrition education, training, and technical assistance resources. As we discuss School Breakfast Week, it is important to also acknowledge the challenges that many school nutrition operators are experiencing with supply chain issues and labor shortages. Team Nutrition has gathered tips and suggestions from school nutrition professionals into several resources focused on planning for a dynamic school environment. Materials include tip sheets, recorded webinars, and communication tools on procurement strategies, meal substitutions, and more. Additionally, on January 31st, 2022, FNS released a request for applications for the fiscal year 2022 Team Nutrition Training Grant for School Nutrition Professional Readiness and Retention. This grant is designed to support state agencies in building and retaining a strong school nutrition workforce that has the knowledge, skills, and the necessary support to provide nutritious meals during school year 22 to 23, as well as 23 to 24. Applications are due by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday, March 14th. Individual schools and school food authorities, or SFAs, are not eligible to apply for the grant, but state agencies are required to provide subgrants to schools and SFAs. These subgrants can be used to fund the items listed on this slide. So with all of that, I turn this over to uh, Shani Sweeney from our Policy and Program Development Division. Shani? Thank you, Mimi. Hi, everyone. Let's jump right on in into the School Breakfast Program requirements. This table provides a quick summary of the school breakfast program meal requirements for each age grade. The school breakfast program requires three meal components for a reimbursable meal, fruit, grains, and milk. There are also daily and weekly minimum amounts of food that must be served for each required meal component. In this table, you will see dietary specifications that are required at breakfast. The dietary specifications state the minimum and maximum amount of calories, saturated fat, trans fat, and sodium allowed, and is averaged over the course of a week. We will cover the current meal pattern waivers, including sodium, in the next few slides. As a recap, the school breakfast program meal requires three meal components, fruit, grains, and milk. Dietary specifications are also required for calories, saturated fat, trans fat, and sodium. Program operators have the flexibility to add vegetables and meat meat alternates in their breakfast menus. Kayleen will cover these meal pattern options in just a little bit. More detailed information about the breakfast meal pattern requirements, regulations, and policy guidance can be found on the FNS School Nutrition Standards webpage using the link or the QR code on this slide. For school year 21-22, FNS issued nationwide waivers to ensure program operators can continue to facilitate safe meal service during the COVID-19 pandemic. The nationwide waiver to allow specific school meal pattern flexibility for school year 21-22 allowed states to grant requests from program operators for specific meal pattern flexibilities. Meal pattern flexibilities can be used for the following meal pattern requirements. That menus meet the dietary specification for sodium. That all grains offered be whole grain rich. To offer a variety of vegetables from the vegetable subgroups. To offer a variety of at least two different options of fluid milk. That low fat flavored milk must be unflavored, and to plan menus and offer components for specified age grade groups. It's important to note that in order to participate under any of the meal pattern flexibilities, schools must contact their state agency for approval. 
while state discretion should be used to determine the need for most of the mill pattern flexibilities, state agencies should provide flexibility for sodium requirements, regardless of the reasoning given. Please note that Congress provided flexibility for schools to offer flavored low-fat flav uh, low milk in school. This flexibility is currently effective through March 11th, and FNS will notify states and program operators if there is an extension or a change to this policy from Congress. If congressional flexibility expires, schools will need to meet the meal pattern requirements and should contact their state agencies. On February 7th, 2022, USDA released a final rule titled Transitional Standards for Milk, Whole Grains, and Sodium. The purpose of this final rule is to provide certainty for program operators and the school food industry for the next two school years, school years 22-23 and 23-24, as we work to develop permanent science-based mill standards that further align school meals with the latest dietary guidelines for Americans. These standards are considered transitional since they are intended to be effective for two school years, beginning with school year 22-23, allowing time to transition from pandemic operation and those supply chain issues. More information and resources about this final rule can be found at the Building Back Better for School Meals webpage. Before I discuss what is covered in the transitional standards, I would like to mention that USDA is inviting public comments on the whole grain rich, sodium and flavored milk requirements, as well as other meal pattern changes that may be needed. Public comments will be provided, will provide the much needed insight from school meal program operators and stakeholders as USDA develops nutrition standards that are ambitious, achievable and durable for the longer term. Comments can be submitted via regulations.gov by March 24th, 2022. Now we will discuss the meal standards that are applicable to the school breakfast program that were established under the transitional standards for milk, whole grains, and sodium final rule. Effective July 1, 2022, schools will have the option to offer flavored low-fat milk at breakfast in addition to being able to offer flavored non-fat skim milk. This rule also requires that unflavored low-fat or fat-free milk be offered at each meal service. It's important to note that offering flavored milk, whether it's low-fat or fat-free, is an option, not a requirement, and operators may choose not to offer flavored milk. Under the transitional standards, schools will be required to offer at least 80% of grains offered weekly to be whole grain rich. The remaining grains must be enriched. And lastly, for the school breakfast program, sodium target one will be effective for school year 22-23 and 23-24. Here are the sodium limits for each A grade group that is in the school breakfast program. Um, these sodium standards will be effective on July 1st, 2022, again for the next two school years, so 22, 23, and 23, 24. As a reminder, sodium limits apply to the average breakfast offered during the week and do not apply per day, per meal, or per menu item. So as you can see for an example, grades K through five, sodium levels at breakfast may not exceed 540 milligrams averaged over the course of the week. For the next two school years. Be sure to check out the FNS Nutrition Standards webpage for available resources about this transitional rule and its requirements. Now I will hand it off to Kayleen to cover team nutrition resources. Thank you, Shawnee, and hello, everyone. My name is Kaylin Padovani, Program Analyst with the Nutrition, Education, and Promotion Branch here at Team Nutrition. Team Nutrition has received lots of questions and requests for resources on specific to topics. And in response, we have developed training resources that we will discuss today in this section of the webinar. 
these resources present menu planning strategies, flexibilities, and options. This may be something that you are working at this moment, or maybe something that you are interested in working in the future. The first publication that we will talk about is offering meets and meet me alternates at school breakfast grades kindergarten to 12. This publication is available in English and in Spanish, online and in print from the web address that you can see at the bottom of the screen. As I mentioned earlier, Team Nutrition has heard that school nutrition operators want more information on how needs and need me alternates may be substituted for part of the grain components at school breakfast. Meats and meat meat alternates can be popular menu items among students. They can also be a valuable source of important nutrients such as protein, B vitamins, iron, and zinc. Some meat meat alternates include eggs, cheese, yogurt, beans, pork, chicken, turkey, tofu, nuts, and seeds. To better explain how meats and meat meat alternates can be offered as part of a reversible school breakfast, let's take a closer look at the school breakfast meal pattern that is shown on this screen and is available on page two of this publication. This meal pattern meets the needs for grades K through 12. As Shawnee mentioned, all school breakfasts must offer items from the three required meal components, which are grains, fruits and or vegetables, and milk. For these required meal components, you must offer minimum amounts of these items every day. These minimum amounts are outlined in orange at the right side of the screen. So, for example, every day you must offer at least one ounce equivalent of grains, one cup of fruits and or vegetables, and one cup of milk. There is also a minimum amount of these foods that you must offer over the course of the week. These weekly amounts are outlined in green at the right side of the screen. So every week you must offer between seven to 10 ounce equivalent of grains, depending on the grade of the students you serve, five cups of fruits and or vegetables, and five cups of milk. So. Where do meats and meat meat alternate fits in? Meats and meat meat alternates are optional, not required at school breakfast. But if you choose to offer meat and meat meat alternates at breakfast, you can count them toward the weekly requirements for grains, as long as you're offering at least one ounce equivalent of grain item at that same breakfast menu. You must also make sure you're offering at least a quarter or 0.25 ounce equivalent of meats and meat meat alternate per serving to credit toward the grain requirement. If you're offering a meat meat alternate at breakfast without offering at least one ounce equivalent of grains, then that breakfast would not be reimbursable. So, for example, let's say you're offering breakfast to students grades K through 12, five days a week. The requirement for K to 12 is one ounce equivalent of grains every day and 10 ounce equivalent of grains per week. This means that some days you will need to offer more than one ounce equivalent in order to meet the weekly grain amounts. There are many ways to get to the 10 ounce equivalent of grains per week. You can offer two ounce equivalent of grains per day that week with no meat meat alternate. This is shown on option number one. Or you can offer one ounce equivalent of grains and one ounce equivalent of meat meat alternates per day. This is shown in option number two. Again, this is because as long as you offer one ounce equivalent of grains every day, you can credit meat and meat meat alternates toward the grain requirement for that week. The key is that you have to offer a grain with the meat or meat meat alternate. 
you not, you cannot offer the meat meat alternate by itself. Similar to option number two is option number three. Here you can offer 1.5 ounce equivalent of grains and half ounce equivalent of meats and meat meat alternate every day. But what do all three of these options have in common? All three options offer at least one ounce equivalent of grains. Option two and three also offer meet me alternates to complete the weekly requirement for grains. Page three of the publication shows how the entire school breakfast for grades K through 12 might look like once you have added in the other required milk component, meaning that you have to offer at least one cup of fruits and or vegetables and at least one cup of milk for a reversible breakfast. Also keep in mind that you can mix and match the options that we presented as needed throughout the week. For example, for many of grades K through 12, you could offer two ounce equivalents of grain on Monday, Wednesday and Friday and offer one ounce equivalent of grains and one ounce equivalent of meat and meat meat alternates on Tuesday and Thursday. Again, offering meats and meat meat alternates at breakfast is optional, not a requirement. Let's put all this information into practice with a polling question. Let's read the question together and then you can click on the correct answer in the polling in the polling that will appear on your screen. The question says, does this breakfast menu offer all the required components? Remember that you are required to offer grains, fruits, and or vegetables and milk for a reversible school breakfast. Vegetables can be served in place of fruits. As you can see on this slide, this menu includes one cup of sweet potato hash brown, one cup of fat-free milk as one of the two milk options offered, and one large egg, which equals two ounce equivalent of meat meat alternate. Does this breakfast offer all required component? Think about it and then click on yes if you think that this menu offers all required component or no, if you think that this menu does not offer all required components. Don't forget to click submit at the bottom of the poll to send out your answers. I will give you some um, seconds to submit your answers. I know that this is the first polling that we do, so let's do a quick countdown. Three, two, one. Let's see your responses. Nice work, everyone. The correct answer here is no. This breakfast menu does not offer all required components. It contains fat-free milk for the milk component, the sweet potato hash brown for the fruit and or vegetable requirement, but does not include a grain. All breakfast menu must offer at least one ounce equivalent of grains every day. You can offer a meat meat alternate such as an egg with a grain, but you must offer a grain at breakfast. So for this breakfast menu, if you added at least one ounce equivalent of grain, like a slice of bread or a waffle, then this breakfast menu would offer all required components for a reversible school breakfast. In addition to the information we just covered, this publication also includes menu planning considerations, tips on using the nutrition fact label to compare the amount of added sugars, saturated fat, and sodium in packaged meats and meat meat alternates, sample menus using traditional meal service as well as offer versus serve, a spotlight section showcasing successful offering meats and meat meat alternate nationwide, budget-friendly ways to include meats and meat meat alternates, and a practice question to help you apply what you have learned from this guide. Thank you for your time and attention. If you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box, and we will try to answer as many as we can at the end of this webinar. 
Now I will turn this over to Mimi Wu, who will talk about a resource related to a very popular breakfast item, smoothies. Thanks, Kayleen. So hi again, everyone. As Kayleen said, I am back to talk about smoothies and are offering smoothies as part of uh, reimbursable school meals for grades kindergarten through 12 training publication. Smoothies can be a fun and trendy way to offer yogurt, milk, and fruits and vegetables as part of school meals, including school breakfast. Smoothies can include a variety of ingredients, so I'll be showing you which ingredients are creditable when you offer a smoothie at breakfast. I will also provide examples of how much of each ingredient is needed in a smoothie in order to credit it toward a reimbursable breakfast. These amounts ensure students get the proper nutrition they need to learn and grow. So this publication is available in English online and in print, as well as online in Spanish from the web address you see at the bottom of the screen. This publication highlights how to offer smoothies as part of a reimbursable school breakfast and lunch. And of course, for today's presentation, we'll focus on offering smoothies at school breakfast. So you can credit smoothies in both scratch made, you can credit ingredients in both scratch made smoothies and commercially made smoothies toward a reimbursable breakfast. The ingredients that can credit are milk, yogurt, fruits, and vegetables, and fruits and vegetables will always credit as juice. So let's take a closer look at how each ingredient can be counted toward a reimbursable breakfast, and this information is on pages eight through 11 of the publication. So each smoothie must contain at least one fourth cup of milk in order to credit it toward the milk component in a small breakfast. The milk must be low fat or fat free. If you use a smoothie that contains one cup of milk per smoothie, then the milk requirement for a school breakfast. That smoothie can then count as one of the two choices for milk. Each smoothie must contain at least one eighth cup or one ounce of yogurt in order for the yogurt to credit toward a reimbursable meal. Yogurt can be unflavored or flavored, Greek or regular, and made from cow's milk or soy milk. Because yogurt is a meat alternate, if you want the yogurt in the smoothie to credit toward a reimbursable breakfast, you need to offer the smoothie with at least one ounce equivalent of grain. Each smoothie must contain at least one eighth cup of fruit and or vegetable juice to credit the smoothie toward the fruit requirement in a reimbursable breakfast. All fruits and vegetables used in a smoothie count as juice, even if you're using canned, frozen, or fresh fruit or vegetables. If the fruit or vegetable is an ingredient in the smoothie, it is considered juice. Similarly, the amount of fruit or vegetable must be measured as a puree or juice when determining the crediting information for the recipe. So remember that juice can be credited towards 50% of the fruit requirement at breakfast in one week. So for example, the weekly requirement for fruit at breakfast is five cups for students in grades kindergarten through 12. This means you may offer no more than two and a half cups of juice in one week. If you offer more than two and a half cups of juice in one week, any juice over that two and a half cups would be considered an extra item and must be included in the weekly calculations for the dietary specifications. Okay, so to recap, the ingredients um, in a smoothie that can be counted towards a reimbursable breakfast are milk, yogurt, and fruits and vegetables, which again, fruits and vegetables credit as, a, as juice when you put it in the smoothie. Remember that the smoothie must be offered with at least one ounce equivalent of grains at breakfast, such as toast, English muffins, bagel, cereal, et cetera. And again, remember that there are minimum amounts of ingredients that must be in each smoothie if you want that ingredient to count towards a reimbursable breakfast. If you added other ingredients to the smoothie, such as grains, nuts and seeds, nut and seed butters, and tofu, those ingredients would not be counted toward a reimbursable breakfast. Instead, those items would be considered extra or additional foods. So for example, if you offered a smoothie that had one cup of low-fat milk, a half cup of oats, and a half cup of fruit per serving, you could count the milk toward the milk component and the fruit as juice 
towards the a fruit component. However, the oats could not be counted towards the grains component since oats are not creditable when you use it as an ingredient in the smoothie. The oats would have to be counted as an extra or additional food, so that means that the oats would count towards calories and other dietary specifications, and you would have to offer a grain item separately in order to make a reimbursable breakfast. If a smoothie contains herbal supplements or protein powder, then none of the ingredients in the smoothie can count towards a reimbursable breakfast. So in other words, if you had a smoothie made with milk, fruit, and protein powder, none of those ingredients could be counted toward a reimbursable breakfast. You couldn't count the milk, you couldn't count the fruit, etc. All of the ingredients in the smoothie would be considered extra or additional food. All of this information is on page 12 of the guide. Okay, so I just threw a ton of information at you. So now let's have you put this information into practice with another polling question. We'll read this question together and then you can click on the correct answer in the poll on the side of your screen. So as you can see, this question says, which smoothies contain only credible ingredients? Choose all that apply. Assume that all of these smoothies will be offered with at least one ounce equivalent of grains or breakfast. Your options are A, a smoothie made with low-fat yogurt, fat-free milk, and frozen peaches. B, a smoothie made with soy yogurt, fat-free milk, and frozen peaches. C, is a smoothie made with low-fat yogurt, fat-free milk, and silken and tofu. D, is a smoothie made with low-fat yogurt, peanut butter, and low-fat milk. And finally, E is made with low-fat yogurt, protein powder, and low-fat milk. So again, you can use pages 8 through 12 of the publication to help you answer this question. Also, this polling question lets you choose all items that apply, which means that you can and should choose more than one answer. Um, and once you have your answers, go ahead and click on the choices in the poll and don't forget to click Submit. Why do I keep saying that? It's because I always forget to click Submit. So be sure to click Submit for your answers. Um, and if you're unable to select or submit an answer, you can just type your answer into the Q&A box and we'll see it that way too. Okay, I'm gonna give you about three more seconds here. Three, two, and one. Let's see, Let's see where we ended up with the poll. All right, nice work, everyone. Thank you for taking my hint about selecting at least two choices. The correct answers here are A, the smoothie made with yogurt, fat-free milk, and frozen peaches, and B, the smoothie made with soy yogurt, fat-free milk, and frozen peaches. All of the ingredients in these two smoothies are creditable toward a reimbursable breakfast. Now, let's take a look at our other smoothies. Smoothie C contains tofu, which is not a credible ingredient, when used in a smoothie. This means that the yogurt and fat-free milk can count towards the requirements for a reimbursable breakfast, but that tofu must be counted as an extra food. Smoothie D contains peanut butter, which is not a credible ingredient when used in a smoothie. So just like smoothie C, this means the yogurt and low-fat milk can count toward the requirements for a reimbursable breakfast, but that peanut butter counts as an extra food. Smoothie E contains protein powder, which is not a credible ingredient when used in a smoothie. If protein powder or herbal supplements are used in the smoothie, then none of the ingredients can count toward a reimbursable meal. This means that the yogurt and the milk in the smoothie would also be treated as extra items. Okay, so now that we know how to identify the credible ingredients in a smoothie, Let's take a closer look at how you could offer smoothies as part of a reimbursable breakfast menu. So this sample menu on your screen is shown on page two of the smoothies publication. Let's say that you offer a smoothie made with blueberry yogurt like what's shown on Tuesday's menu. Each smoothie includes a half cup of pureed blueberries and a half cup of low-fat vanilla Greek yogurt. The blueberries would credit as juice towards the fruit requirement and you would need to offer another half cup of fruits to meet the daily minimum of one cup of fruit at breakfast. So in this example, we are offering a half cup of apricots with our smoothie to meet this one cup of fruit requirement. 
Well, remember earlier when Kayleen explained that you could credit meats and meat alternates at breakfast if you're offering at least one ounce equivalent of grains that day. Well, because you're offering one ounce equivalent of grains at this breakfast, and that's that whole, um, that one cup of whole grain rich cereal you see, you can credit the yogurt in the smoothie as a meat meat alternate. So that means that the one ounce equivalent of yogurt counts as one ounce equivalent towards the weekly grains requirement. Okay, let's do another polling question to put this information together. As you can see, this question says, does this menu offer all the required components for a school breakfast? This menu is offering one cup of low-fat milk on its own, as well as a smoothie that's made with one cup of fat-free milk, one cup of pureed strawberries, and one ounce equivalent, or a half cup, of low-fat vanilla yogurt. Remember that at breakfast, you must offer at least one cup of milk, one cup of fruit, and one ounce equivalent of grains as well as the choice of two different types of milk. So think about this a little bit and click on yes if you think this menu meets all required components, or click on no if you think this menu does not offer all required components for a reimbursable school breakfast. Okay, I'm gonna give you all just a few more seconds here. Three, two, and one, let's see results are. All right, nice work everyone. So the correct answer here is no. The breakfast menu does not offer all required components. As many of you answered, it's missing one ounce equivalent of grains. This menu meets the milk requirement by providing a choice of milk, either the one cup of low-fat milk by itself or the one cup of fat-free milk in the smoothie. The one cup of pureed strawberries in the smoothie meets the requirement of one cup of fruits per day. The smoothie also provides one ounce equivalent of low-fat yogurt, which is a meat alternate, but this breakfast doesn't provide any grains. So in order to make this breakfast reimbursable, you need to offer one ounce equivalent of grains, such as a slice of bread, a mini bagel, a bowl of cereal, et cetera. If you added that one ounce equivalent of grains with this breakfast, then the menu would offer all the required components for a school breakfast the yogurt could then credit towards the weekly grains requirement at breakfast. So the information we've covered today is just a small sampling of the information in our offering smoothies as part of Reimbursable School Meals Guide. This guide also includes additional sample menus, including menus for serving smoothies at lunch, crediting tips, information about documentation, a standardized recipe for peach and yogurt smoothie that yields 50 and 100 servings, success stories, practice questions, and more. Thank you all so much for your time and attention today, and I will now turn this actually back over to Kayleen. And again, if you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A box, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of today's webinar. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Mimi. I am excited to be back to talk about a new Team Nutrition resource. This week, Team Nutrition just released the best practices for reducing added sugars at school breakfast. This is a training guide that outlines optional best practices that school nutrition professionals can use to reduce added sugars at school breakfast. This training guide includes the following topics. How to determine the amount of added sugars in foods and in drinks. Menu planning tips to reduce added sugars in recipes, tips for reducing added sugars in recipes, talking with families and caregivers about added sugars, and much more. So let's take a closer look at the content of this publication. As we have talked today, school breakfasts are an important source of whole grains, fruits, and low-fat or fat-free milk for school-aged children. Schools also have the option to offer vegetables, meats, and meat alternates at breakfast. To further align school breakfast with the recommendations of the dietary guidelines for Americans, schools can take additional steps to reduce the amount of added sugars offered throughout the week. Reducing added sugars is important because about three out of four school age children are eating and drinking too much added sugars every day. Everyone in school 
including school, parents, caregivers, can play a role in helping children to have access to lower sugar options at meals and snacks. Making these options available to children will help them get the nutrients they need without consuming too many calories. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend that all Americans ages 2 and older consume less than 10% of their total calories per day from added sugars. To best understand the amount of added sugars in a food or a drink, it is important to note that the information is often written in grams, and one gram of added sugars has four calories. Therefore, to convert grams of added sugars into calories, you need to multiply the amount of added sugars in grams by four and get the amount of calories in of the added sugars. Now, where do I find information of added sugars? To find the amount of added sugars in the items you're serving, you can use the nutrition fact label which is required to be in most packaged foods and drinks. The nutrition fact label tells you the amount of nutrients in one serving of a product. On the screen, we have an example of the nutrition fact label of a breakfast cereal. This breakfast cereal shows on the label on the left, the serving size, which is one cup and the information of added sugars is listed at the right side of the label under the total sugars row. So this label tell us that one cup of this breakfast has eight grams of added sugars. The information of added sugars may not be available in all nutrient analysis software programs because companies were not required to provide this information on the nutrition fact label until recently. At this time, USDA does not require data on added sugars to be included in the USDA approved nutrient analysis software for child nutrition programs. The Food Data Central is a free database of food products that may be a good source of information on added sugars in food in the future as companies start to add this information into this database. The web address to this database is included at the bottom of this slide. Before we go into more details about added sugars at school breakfast, let's do a quick polling question to see what items at school breakfast often are sources of added sugars. You can select one or more than one option from the options below, which are apples, toaster pastries, chocolate milk, 100% orange juice, cinnamon buns. I will give you a few seconds to think about it and submit your answer. And also remember to submit, to click on submit. I'm going to also put my answer here and I will give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. Time is up. Let's check your answers. Okay, I see them here. Great job, everyone. I know this was a tricky question, so let's discuss the answer together. The correct answers are B, toaster pastries, C, chocolate milk, and E, cinnamon buns. All of these items were recognized as sources of added sugars at school breakfast based on the USDA School Nutrition and Milk Cost Study published in January 2021. The contribution of these items were based on the amount of added sugars per serving and the frequency they were served. As a reminder, fresh fruits and 100% fruit juices do not include added sugars. So how can we reduce added sugars at school breakfast? This publication provides several strategies for reducing added sugars in school breakfast meal. Again, 
These are suggestions, not requirements. So you can choose which strategies might work best for your program. You can start with one or a few strategies and implement others gradually. Strategies listed in this publication include choosing foods and drinks that meet sugar limits using other nutrition assistance programs, reducing the amount of added sugars in recipes, planning school meals that on average contain less than 10% of calories from added sugars, and getting student input to help ensure they like the new or modified menu item. This publication also has a section to help you address concerns that parents and caregivers may have about added sugars at school breakfast, including concerns about the amount of added sugars in school breakfast food, types and amount of carbohydrate in school breakfast food, and low or no calorie sweeteners, sometimes known as high intensity sweeteners. Remember, that talking with families can be an excellent opportunity to share information about the steps your school is taking to offer healthy and nutritious school breakfast meals. Finally, this publication also includes the following information. What is the difference between added sugars and total sugars? Identifying added sugars in the ingredient list and what are some common names for added sugars, tables with recommended sugar limits for cereals and yogurt, recommended limits for added sugars for total calories at school breakfast, and a try it, out, try it out section so you can apply what you have learned. As you can see, there is lots of great information in here, so we encourage you to take some time to look at this publication when you have a chance. Thank you again for your time and attention today. Remember to send us any question through the Q&A box and we will try to respond it at the end of this webinar. Now I will turn it over back to Mimi for some reminders and to take some of the questions you have submitted to us. Sure. So hi again, everyone. And as Kayleen said, we'll give you a moment now just to enter any last questions in the Q&A box. Um, and in the meantime, I just wanted to reiterate some key points from today's webinar, because I know we went through a lot of stuff in a very short amount of time. So first, school breakfast plays an important role in improving the nutrition security of children. As you all very uh, well know, school breakfast is an especially important source of fruit, whole grains, and dairy foods. Also, smoothies and meat meat alternates can be offered as part of a reimbursable uh, breakfast meal, and Team Nutrition definitely has resources to show you how. There are also several ways that schools can reduce added sugars in school breakfast. Check out Team Nutrition's brand new, as in we just released it uh, this week, um, our brand new best practices to reduce added sugars at school breakfast training guide for ideas. New transitional meal pattern standards for school breakfast go into effect on July 1st, 2022. We would love, love, love for you to comment on the standards by submitting your thoughts on the regulations.gov website by March 24th, 2022. So again, we'll be sending you the link to submit comments in tomorrow's post-webinar email. So please be sure to keep an eye out for that. And finally, applications for fiscal year 2022 team nutrition training grants for school nutritional professional readiness and retention are due this coming Monday, March 14th, 2022. So with that, let's move on to some questions and answers. And how this will work is that I will answer a few questions and I'll pass it over to Shawnee who will answer a few and then she'll pass it over to Kayleen and we'll just kind of keep going like that in a, a round robin until time is up. So I will start with two questions, which I love because at Team Nutrition, we love it when our resources are used. And um, we got this question several times, which is, will these slides be available for us to print after today's webinar? And the answer to that is yes. So by 5 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow, you'll be receiving an email from us with all of the web addresses we talked about today as well as a PDF file of all the presentation slides. 
These presentation slides will also be available to download from the Team Nutrition website. So please just keep your eyes uh, open for this email. It will come from teamnutrition at usva.gov. Again, you'll get it by 5 p.m. tomorrow Eastern time. Um, sometimes our emails get stuck in your spam or your junk folder, so definitely um, keep an eye there as well if you don't see anything from us by 5 p.m. tomorrow. Similarly, we had another question that said, will this presentation be available on YouTube? I would like for another person to watch, and she was unable to watch today. Um, so whoever sent that in, thank you for watching out for your coworkers. And the answer to that is yes. So this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will send it off for it to get captioned. And once it's captioned, we'll upload it to our website uh, via YouTube. And for everyone who registered today, you'll get an email once this webinar is available. So keep your eyes peeled for that as well. Um, and I will now turn it over to Shawnee for a few questions, but don't worry, I'll be back. Thank you, Mimi. Okay, so um, I'm gonna answer the question, why doesn't the USDA meal pattern for breakfast slash lunch align with the less than 10% of calories for added sugar from the dietary guidelines? This is a very good point. Currently in our meal pattern, we do not have dietary specifications for added sugar. However, I would like to say again that with the final rule, we are asking for public comments, um, not only just for milk, whole grains, and sodium, but other meal pattern changes that you would like to see in the upcoming proposed rule, which includes added sugar. So if added sugars is important to you and you want us to know about it, please submit your comments. Um, someone else asked a really good question about can making a coffee drink with eight ounces of milk count towards the milk component at breakfast? Um, this is a very good question. So I just want to say, yes, eight ounces of flavored milk um, can be used in coffee beverages. However, it's important to note that the things that are added in, if the students are paying for it, like coffees and syrups and um, whipped creams and things, then the smart stack standards uh, go into play. So just keep that in mind. There is a Smart Snacks um, Q&A that goes over coffee beverages and things like that because coffee is only allowed um, for high school students in Smart Snacks. So I would encourage you to um, look into the Smart Snacks Q&A. All right, I'm going to pass it on to Kayleen. Thank you, Shawnee. Um, so we have received here a question related to offering neatly alternate sets as a extra food um and yes these they mentioned here could you talk about offering extra food at breakfast the guidance on the document on make me alternate touches eat briefly but i would like more, some more details um the reason why we touched very briefly about using meet me alternates as a extra food it was to show how it can be serve as a reversible school breakfast. However, yes, you can offer meat meat alternates as an extra food, but as Mimi mentioned in the smoothies, then these need to be counted for your dietary weekly specification for calories, sodium, and um, saturated fat as well. So that's the reason, and I hope that I answer your, your question there. And also we have received so many questions on how or where you can find these publications that we have discussed today. They can be found on the Team Nutrition website, which is teamnutrition.usda.gov, but we will send out uh, the specific links to the publication in our post webinar email tomorrow. So I will pass it over to Mimi to respond to more questions here that we have received. Sure. Sure, thank you everyone. So there was another question, does anyone have a good smoothie recipe they like? Um, and so of course I took it a chance to promote our um, offering smoothies as part of reimbursable school meals, which I keep handy at all times, but there is um, a peach and yogurt smoothie recipe that we developed especially for this guide um, and that credits for school meals. So I encourage you all to go and check that out at the publication um, in that publication so and um yeah definitely let us know if you like it and if you um tried it um another question we got about smoothies is if there are chunks of fruit floating in my smoothie does it still count as juice and the answer that that is yes 
all fruits and vegetables used as ingredients in smoothies still count as juice. So even if the fruit or vegetable in your smoothie appears in uh, pieces or chunks in the smoothie, it is still credited as juice. Um, we have about five more minutes left. So Shani, I'll have you answer a question and then Kayleen, and then we um, will go ahead and wrap this. Thank you. Great, so I had a couple of questions about the transitional standards. Um, so again, um, just to reiterate, the question was, is the sodium target per day or average over the week? So again, sodium standards for the transitional standards for next year are gonna be averaged over the week. So there's no standard for um, items per like a, per item or per meal, it's always average over the course of the week. And that really just gives people flexibility as far as having maybe a little bit higher sodium on one day and a little bit less sodium on, a, on, a, another, on another day. And then there was a question about the milk options. Let's see, um, are two milk options still required? So yes, in our school milk programs, at least two options must be provided. Um, and one of those options must be unflavored. Uh, so currently during school year 21-22, program operators may request a waiver from their state agency um, with the nationwide COVID meal pattern waiver, which allows for some meal pattern flexibility. Alrighty, so Kayleen, I'm handing it off to you. Thank you, Shawnee. I received another question here. It says, I am in a school district that only serves ready to eat products eggs, sandwiches, etc., are not feasible. Many products available are really sugary. How we can lobby for better products for our students is really hard to reduce sugar when the products are outside of our control. So for this one, um, normally you could work with your procurement process on how and the vendors that you have available to determine a goal for the added sugar content of your products. And that way, working with your organization, your SFA, your vendors, and even your school, you can find other options to change the procurement and reduce the added sugars for those. So thank you so much. It's very important because there are so many schools that are purchasing a food, so it's important to talk with your vendors. And lastly, I have a question here. Mimi mentioned about um, the receiving a certificates of attendance. So we will be sending out, as, men, as Mimi mentioned, some certificates on March 23rd. And you can share it as, uh, with, the, the, with those that attended with you. Mimi, I will pass it over to you. Perfect, perfect. Kayleen, you, I couldn't help myself. I was about to answer that certificate question. So she was like, I'll just, I'll just do it. I'll have a mic. So again, that is all the time um, we have for today. Um, but please, please, please know that even if we didn't get to your question, we do still read them and go through them and use that to inform us in terms of um, the other products that we develop. Um, we also read all the comments in the post webinar survey that's gonna pop up on your screen after we end today. So please, 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 please be sure to fill that out as well. And again, this helps us make sure that the materials and webinars and everything else that we develop truly meets your needs. Um, so again, we know how busy everyone is and we just so appreciate that you made the time to join us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next Meal Talk webinar, which will be held in August in honor of Back to School. Registration for that webinar should open sometime in July. And in the meantime, please keep an eye out for some emails from us in the next few weeks. Again, tomorrow you guys will be getting um, an email with all the websites we talked about today, as well as of a PDF file for the webinar slides. Those will also be posted on our website. On March 23rd, everyone who stayed on for this entire webinar will get a certificate of attendance. And again, you can print one out for um, other people who are watching it with you, and they'll have information about getting um, professional education credits and things like that. And then in a few weeks, everyone who registered for this webinar will get an email once the um, recording of this webinar is available. So that's kind of what's coming from us next. And um, we just hope that you have a wonderful day and happy National School Breakfast Week. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.